Hello everyone! I am Jonathan, also known as the Medieval Genie, and today we're going to be talking about sport fencing. And I've done a video about this before, but previously I had less experience because I was doing Historical European Martial Arts, which I'll shorten to HEMA. Um, that I've been doing for a number of years, but sport fencing I've only done recently. That's in the last sort of few months or so, but it means the difference between I've sort of I've fought against people who had that background, I knew about sport fencing and those sorts of things to some extent, but I didn't have as much hands-on experience. So I feel like I've got more to contribute now compared to when I made the last video. So let's get started on that, shall we? So firstly, um, there are actually quite a lot of similarities as well as differences. And when I'm talking about the stuff today, uh, it should also be noted that although I've had a range of experience in HEMA, so I've done, you know, things ranging from unarmed to some degree to pole arms, swords, things like military saber, long sword, arming sword, a bit of sword and shield and things, and some other styles like dagger and other things, even looked into a little bit of how sickle works. So I'm fairly confident in that area, but it should be noted that when it comes to sport fencing, I have tried some epee, I think it is, but I have mostly be fo been focusing on sabre. So just bear that in mind, but still worth discussing anyway. So when it comes to sport fencing versus HEMA, the most obvious difference would be in the rule set. So when we look at uh, historical European martial arts, the rules can vary, but the key, well, we've got a few key differences, so I'll break this down in the rules. So firstly, there's a thing called priority. Now, this doesn't apply to all of the styles in sport fencing. Uh, it seems to be mostly a sabre thing, but if, let's say, I'm attacking you, and I've started launching an attack, so I've put my body forward, I've put the arm extension, and I'm stabbing towards you, and then af after I've started that, you then do a stop thrust, as in you've basically I've come towards you, and I've performed a thrust in, say at your shoulder, and then in the meantime you performed a thrust in at my heart. In HEMA rules, we've both hit each other, so there'd be some kind of net exchange of points, or just straight up nobody has scored anything, or even something like we've scored against each other, and you know, the amount of points for the hit to each other and lives and however it'll work, it'll basically be equal, more or less. Whereas with priority in the fencing, because I've shown my intention and started taking the space first, instead it then just counts flatly as I scored, as though your attack never even happened. Which, of course, as you can imagine, to a salty fencer like me, is not my favourite rule. <laughs> But I can understand to some degree that there might be some reasons why it's encouraged. I say that as my mind blanks thinking, why the hell do people do this? But anyway, yeah, I mean, I suppose it might be to do with the encouragement of trying to take the initiative and stuff like that, but... Yeah, suffice it to say, I don't like that rule. I don't like it. That it's there, it happens, and we must acknowledge it. Apart from that, uh, one of the key rules is what's called the piste, which is just, um, if, if you've never seen sort of Olympic or sport fencing before, you have a sort of a, a corridor, an area with a certain breadth, I think it's about a metre and a half or something like that, and I think it also can vary sometimes in less official sort of tournaments and whatnot, but um, you have a breadth that you're allowed to play in, and let's say you know, I perform my attack and nobody's done anything back. Okay, if that's within the piece, simple, yep, I score. If, however, I went outside of the line and then made my attack, it doesn't count. Sorry. And it can be, you can, there seem to be some rules around it, like um, if both people attack each other, 
if one of them is outside of the line, then priority rules are ignored, the person who is outside the line doesn't get anything scored, and the person who is still inside gets their points calculated, as though I didn't do anything to them. Um, I can maybe understand to some degree if you've got certain tournaments or training halls and things, you've got these this all sort of pieces which are there to restrict the areas and say, okay, you can fence within this, don't sort of chase each other all the way around the halls because that would be extremely messy. And as someone who's done HEMA and had, you know, historical European martial arts studies and has spent time in an area, we actually train, well, the, the club that I go to trains in a church, which is a really nice, really sort of poetic, also kind of ironic background. I say ironic because we're training, obviously we're not actually going to war, but we're training arts that used to be used for murdering people in a place dedicated to the god of peace. Anyway, but uh, it means that sometimes people train in an area where sometimes, you know, we try to be careful around each other and not get mixed up, but inevitably maybe some of the fencing is starting to drift and we've got to say, all right, hang on, you know, we've got to cancel, we've got to hold up for a moment. And I've got my classic hold up my hand. Wait, wait, hold on a minute. Uh, we've got people going through the area. We've got some people are fencing and they've gone a bit too close to us and all this. So actually, from a training and, you know, a, a real realistic sort of, we've got this much space, we need to work within that type of perspective. It makes sense. But martially speaking, in the, in the, deadly combat or the, you know, duel to first blood, whatever you want to look at, whether it's some kind of historical tournament, a duel to the death, duel to first blood, self-defense on the street, warfare, those kinds of scenarios, actually free movement should be encouraged because you can have quite a significant impact on your opponent. Um, a quick note about that, actually. I, I, in fact, this is actually another attempt at this same video. The last one took 45 minutes. I'm redoing it a bit more professionally. <laughs> but um, I found that the closer you are to your opponent, the more offline footwork works. So if I'm out here, I'm a bit of a distance away from the camera. So let's say I take a side step. <sighs> ah. I'm not really having so much of an impact. Whereas, hang on, I'm going across a solid object a bit here. Whereas if I do some lateral movement closer, it has a more significant impact. The further away you are, it's just, it's just science, I guess, or mathematics even. The further away you are, the less of an impact it has, whereas at a closer distance, you're having more significant impact. But it does take play, it does factor in when you start actually engaging and binding up and whatnot, which is why if you look at things like a uh, Fiore or other types of sort of long sword treatises, there are plays that specifically use going around or even behind your opponent. You can even see, I've seen, like for example, one which is a half sword play. Quickly, a uh, half sword is where you grip the blade, for, you know, actually halfway up or more, so that you can finely manipulate it, especially with two handed swords. You can do it with pretty much any sword. And uh, one of the plays is that you've bound up your opponent and then I've gone around, so we've been kind of binding up, we're thinking, okay, what can I do? Maybe if I try to go around and attack the opponent, they'll just parry it out and we'll just be fighting, you know, it'll be neutral, we're not actually gaining an advantage. I feel like they're too confident swinging a sword around, so okay, let's do sword fighting that does not involve swinging the sword around, so I might go around and then actually run around, behind, go around behind the opponent, half sword it, and then basically grip it using it as a bar around the neck, either to sort of show surrender now, or a little movement and you die, or even just straight up, nope, you die. Uh, you know, whatever they, that would have been used for. Um, but that sort of thing doesn't really happen so much in sport fencing, because you're discouraged from that offline footwork. I have been able to, and this is a little strategy, if you come from this sort of HEMA type of background and want to use that against someone who's doing a sport fencing background and is not used to this and only understands linear forwards and backwards footwork, 
the trick to use is hug the line. So you've got, I've mentioned you've got a certain width of the piece. Now if I stay in the middle and I try an offline step, uh, it's not going to have as much of an effect. I've not got much room for a step. It might have, it might make the difference between I've just barely been parried and maybe I can cut down at the wrist or something more subtle like that. But I, a dum-dum like me needs a bit more of an obvious advantage. So I'll hug the line and naturally my, I find that my opponents who are used to sport fencing, they want to act like pistons and only go forwards and backwards, that sort of narrow-mindedness. So uh, when I hug the lines, they tend to hug the lines with me, which is quite useful. And then as we get closer together, as I mentioned, when we're back here, my offline footwork doesn't really have much an effect. That's why I'm staying in this same screen right now, not really having much an impact. But as you get closer and closer, not only am I getting close enough and maybe doing something like a covered entry, I'm attacking to test their defences, parrying what they're doing, and trying to close the distance. And you've got to make sure you've got a firm defence to do this, because otherwise you just die on the way in. Um, when you're doing that, you get to the right range, and then, because I'm hugging one line, whether it's to my left or to my right, whatever handedness I am, I hug one side, and then, when I'm getting quite close, I can then go the full width across to the other line, and then start attacking them from an angle that they don't expect, or even parry and control the line from there, because opponents tend to fight within a certain line. So if I if I'm in a stance and I'm pointing towards you now, this is basically my line. If I don't move and adapt to you and you're starting to come outside, targets open up. So I'll do that towards the camera. So let's say you're stepping off line and it's looking more like this. There's the obvious this far, which can happen in something like HEMA where okay, you're really outside the opponent and I need to completely turn out to start adapting to where you are, you know, and make basically adjust themselves to your new position, or they're completely open and exposed. They can't really attack you properly until they move and adjust. You've got basically free attacks. But um, in something like sport fencing, when you're using the full width of the piece, it's more subtle but you can still see from the camera angle here, the difference between here, I can have this, I'm on guard, I'm on guard, I'm on guard, I can, I can adjust, I can parry your cuts and thrusts and whatnot that are coming in. Whereas out here, no, I'll need to actually turn out to adjust to you. Otherwise, even something like trying to adapt, I might get a parry, but it's a bit sketchy. I'll want to really turn out and face you, which means that I'm reacting afterwards and all this type of stuff. See, that's one way you can take them off guard. So the piste can restrict people's training, but I do understand why it exists. And I say that about it being a thing in HEMA. To be honest, a lot of times when people move around each other, they're doing it at distance. And 90% of the time, this type of moving around each other isn't really having an impact. It's like the, the people are wanting to close in and do this stuff, but they're kind of, you know, there's a threatening sword from their opponent, and their opponent is not an idiot, they're not rooted in place like a tree, they'll turn and adjust. So a lot of times these attempts don't really come to fruition, and it is just the very same forwards-backwards type of stuff, rather than any actual impact happening from moving around the opponent. But the fact that people are trying that, which means that they will sometimes succeed, like I said, the other 10% when it does work, it's that kind of stuff that makes a difference. Because techniques aren't, you know, it, when we look at any martial art, techniques are not the learn this, you will always win. It's more like if you're trying out stuff to see if you can get some purchase at some sort of advantage to you and or disadvantage at the opponent, if you can keep prodding and prying at that stuff, aha, maybe you'll get it. If you don't, well, you can play it tentatively and maybe there's something else you've learnt and that works, you know? That's how it works when you're doing HEMA or sport fencing or perhaps other martial arts, I'd say, as well. Um, what else in the rules? Uh, 
you've got the electric scoring system, so one of the things that can also have a bit of a difference is the afterblow timer. Now an afterblow, let's say you stab me and I get it's gone. One, two. So that's pretty much simultaneous, like a double hit. Whereas if, let's say, we were trying something, let's say I was coming around in to stab you, you've gone, stab me on the way in, stab. I've done an after blow, it's in the same tempo, it's not like, you know, unlike in the movies, the moment a person takes any kind of wound, <gasps> they're frozen in place. That's crap. Real life fights and documentation of fights have said that no, that doesn't normally happen. If someone's got some momentum going, if they're already executing some sort of attack or parry, that will usually continue after they have been attacked. And then they'll, you know, they might gradually weaken and fall over from blood loss. But uh, if you've attacked me first, clearly first, but I'm in the middle of executing that attack towards you, in something like sport fencing, the, the afterblow time is narrow enough that they would say, ah, you got the point. Whereas in something like Hema, normally it'd be more like, well, you're both in tempo, you're both attacking each other, so, you know, it's fairly neutral or, you know, net exchange of points like cut to the head, cut to the arm, head hits better, all that type of stuff. You know, different, Hema does have different rule sets. And that will be my final point in terms of rules. HEMA has variable rules, so if you've got, uh, I, I work in the United Kingdom, so I'm looking at examples like Wessex League, Fight Camp, Standard Club Rules, or other types of events at the main melee, they have often different sets of rules, which means I've encountered such instances as, I mentioned about doubles and afterblows, I've seen a version where you have the, if you have a double or after blow, it's purely the weight of points, so what hit did I get and what's the quality of the hit? Deciding who hit first is irrelevant. I've seen after blows reducing opponent's points, so it could be I stabbed you, then you stabbed me. I, I don't get full points because you got me back, but I've taken reduced points for the after blow. Um, I've also seen versions where, if it's a double or after blow, nobody scores anything at all, try again, try actually fighting properly, and the most extreme version I've heard of was that not only do you not score anything when you do a double, or it was fully weighted or something like that, but if you did at that double or after blow, so you're hitting each other enough, three times against the same opponent, so in the same sort of match, you're disqualified, which I thought was quite a juicy, if scary, rule, because, you know, you can potentially get disqualified for taking a hit. But it was a good idea, because it encourages people to actually hit the opponent without being hit. One of the problems I've had in things like sport fencing is that people are suicidally devoted to their attack, because if they can if they can make enough of a show of themselves and leap towards their opponent, then they can forcibly claim priority, and then, if, if such applies, and then they'll attack their opponent, either they've both got each other, in which case, a eh, fairly neutral exchange, or their opponent didn't hit them, in which case, being all 100% attack and not giving a care about your life, you will basically come out on top points-wise, whereas from a martial point of view, whatever the Matt Eason's favourite word, context, and whatever the context, I mean, I don't know about you, but, I mean, you know, this could be some kind of weird, I'm from another planet type thing, but I have an aversion to going to hospital, you know? Dying is a bad thing. But, uh, obviously it seems some people disagree, they like leaping on each other's weapons, Good for you, I guess, kamikaze pilot wannabes? Hey. Um, but yes, it means that it can lead to a bad habit emerging in things like sport fencing, which I'll go into a sidetrack of hints now. Second hint, if you're up against a sport fencer who likes to do that, find a si if I find that when they commit so much with every fibre of their being to that one attack, 
it does mean that they fall apart after that first attack. So as if you can focus on, okay, survive that one attack, I'm okay now. So it, as scary as it can seem at first, and how terrifying it is that a person's essentially leaping like some human missile with a pointy weapon at you, we're just launching themselves violently at you. If you can survive that initial contact, you've almost got a free hit out of them. And the more they do it, the more their abilities collapse after that first or second or third attack. Or, you know, a defence. Um, so what I like to do is they, they'll, I'll sort of, I'll start coming towards them. So I'll show in some intention, maybe some testing hits. Oh, can I hit the wrist? Do, do, do a little bit of tippy-tappy, Errol Flynn style, and a bit of woo -boo -boo. Do, do, Can I do a little thrust, a little hit? No, 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 okay. And I'm just coming towards them, and then when they see, or even we haven't even made contact with the blades yet, and we're still out of measure. Out of measure being where we can't hit each other yet. Uh, so I'm coming towards them a little bit, just showing a bit of intention. Oh, I think I might want to attack you today. And then that triggers them because they're like a terrier. No, they're like a, a whippet. They're, oh, oh, I've seen the target. Whoosh! So they they launch the attack. So I start showing, oh, I'm coming towards you. Oh, they're launching the attack. At which point I backtrack really solidly and deliberately parry whatever it is they're trying at me. Make sure that that will not hit me. Screw your attack. Absolute determination like some sort of anime level crap. And then when that attack's happened, hit them back immediately before they have a chance to recover. Focus absolutely on that solid defense. And then as soon as you know it's over, as soon as they've fallen from that attack, you know, they're, they're sort of leaping at you when they've, they've tried a thrust or a cut. It's usually a thrust. Actually, it can sometimes be a cut. Uh, when they're doing a cut or thrust, they launch at you. As soon as you've taken it offline, or even voided the attack, that's one of my favourites, because uh, some fences like to target shallow targets like the arm, just retract the arm back, nope, step back, now I can get you. Because they're so committed to that first attack that it almost is inconceivable to them. Again, this doesn't, bearing in mind, humans aren't a hive mind, surprise, surprise, so I'm applying this to specific fences. You will encounter other fences who don't behave like this at all. You know, it, it's a sliding scale. Some of them are absolutely all attack and don't care about their defence and fall apart with this strategy perfectly. And then it's a sliding scale to fences who know actually this doesn't work at all. It, your mileage may vary. Um, but yes, it's still quite a useful strategy to learn. And I've mentioned people sometimes like to hit shallow targets, so if you retract the arm, you just you can do your defences and things, you're tighter to the body when you do this. This works best with a cutting weapon like a sabre. Uh, with something like a thrusting weapon, less so, because it's important to keep the point forward. But with something that's a cutting weapon like a sabre, use it as an iron bar to keep yourself protected, and then repost later. Or even, you know, if, they've, if you've voided the attack and they've whiffled, they've missed you completely, deliver that punishment to them. Uh, so yes, I've, I've digressed a little bit, but um, other differences, uh, the weight of the weapons, I was surprised, I thought I'd do a video, you know, a video like this, and I'd say, well, well, let me tell you a story, well, 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 our weapons are proper weight, and it makes such a difference, but no, actually, it doesn't really seem to make such a difference. Uh, the one key thing I've noticed is that when you do a beat, so someone hit my, hits my weapon, I'm taken offline, whoopsie, and the recovery time, it, it's less of a significant thing. I'm taken offline, I recover quickly. With a heavier weapon, let me take out my Langsax, yes, I forged this myself, uh, but the tip broke off during test cutting, glossing over that. If I have a heftier weapon and someone takes it offline, I mean, it's not like on TV and movies where someone attacks my weapon and, oh, oh, butterfingers, I've dropped my weapon. Happens a lot of foam weapons, I've noticed, but with actual steel weapons, no, it doesn't happen. It really doesn't. I've, you know, I've done this HEMA and sport fencing total of over ten years now, and I can count on one hand the number of times a person's been disarmed by their weapon being hit. That tells you how pathetically rare it is. But, um, 
When you've got this sort of thing going, still, when you've been beaten aside with a heavier weapon, when you, well, as in when you've got a heavier weapon, if you've been successfully beaten aside, it's a slow recovery. It's not like you're drunk and it's all, oh, okay, and later I'll recover. But there, it's just a little bit more, you know, it's a fraction of a second, but it's still noticeably more than with something like a sport fencing weapon. Any of the sport fencing weapons, that they, I know they can have varying weights, but compared to the sorts of weapons we use in HEMA, they're all basically very tiny little sticks, like a uh, car antenna, you know, radio antenna, with a, with, a, with a handle attached, like this. This is actually not for sport fencing, well, this isn't originally for sport fencing, it's uh, designed for a small sword. Small sword being, I'll talk about it in another video, but... Um, Slightly different kind of weapon, but the one of the, possibly the basis of things like foil and epee, the historical ancestor of them. Um, but yes, it means that that can affect how the recovery time goes and the amount of time that you purchase for an attack. So I could go beat, attack. The time that I have to do that if I do a beat with these lighter weapons is much narrower and I need to act much faster. And if you're going to do that thing, practice your mulane, the... Uh, the rotation of the wrist and whirling around the attack. Practice it until you can do it at lightning speed if you want it to work. Otherwise, don't do it. Um, but apart from that, the way that the weapons behave is more or less the same. The only other thing I've noticed that's a bit of a piss take with sport fencing is um, they do whip around. So I've had some moments where I've parried and I thought for sure that I would have parried it, but it's kind of, the weapon has bent around and touched me at a curve. It's almost like it became a temporary falcata or falx. You know, there's this kind of, it, it used to be a straight weapon and now whoop, it's bending forwards and I haven't accounted for that because I've accounted for a straight weapon because the opponent has a straight weapon. So I'm treating it like one and then when I parry it like one, oh whoopsie, it's whipped around to me. But that I don't think can stop really too much. And it doesn't happen all the time. It's something that happens sometimes. It annoys me when it happens. But you can adapt to it. And if you do a more distinct, if you parry it more distinctly, then, you know, firstly, you're keeping yourself safer by making sure you've parried good instead of just barely. Encourage just good technique. But additionally, it's not such a problem that it will happen all the time. So again, the, the behaviour, although it will certainly feel different for a sport fencer to pick up a full weight weapon, the actual way that you treat it is more or less the same, comparatively speaking, I've found. Um, what else? Uh, apart from that, yes, I've found that the, I've, based on all the factors I've mentioned before, one of the things that was interesting is that the people who had that sport fancy only background noticed me at the club that I go to for sport fencing in Crediton and the and another guy who lives in the area who also does HEMA you know has the same background as me coming from HEMA into sport fencing he noticed that the two of us fight more defensively because again clean hits and the way the weapons behave you're more distinctly you know just in general with the way the weapons behave and all this stuff I'm trying to get what are called clean hits, which means I hit the opponent and I've received no wounds or injuries in return whatsoever. Which is actually, a, even with things like sport fencing, I have on some occasions claimed priority, but it's mostly by accident. I try, even in sport fencing, even knowing that I can claim priority, I can make a show of being aggressive and claim the priority, their attack no longer counts and mine does. I try not to get into that bad, ha bad habit on purpose. I try to always hit clean. If I'm attacking my opponent, I'm on the assumption that I'm not being hit back, which sometimes doesn't work, but that's just bad fencing. But the attitude is I'm trying to hit the opponent without being hit. Um, so having that type of attitude, it has meant that some people have noticed that me and the other guy seem to fight noticeably more defensively, which is ironic considering the guy, I am quite a defensive sort of counter repost type of fencer, but he is not. He uh, he likes to close in, he likes to grapple with people, he likes to sort of get it, get stuck in and brawl with people. 
and all that kind of stuff. And it's hilarious that even a guy like him, who likes to dance around people and I think of him almost like a coyote kind of whipping around and gnawing at your heels type of stuff, but even he looks defensive to some fencers, which again speaks of the attitude difference between some of the stuff I've seen in sport fencing versus HEMA. Again, humans are not all a hive mind, your mileage may vary, and this does not apply to all fencers from HEMA and from sport fencing universally, but broadly speaking, from my experience at least. Um, yes, the, then the final thing would just be that uh, because grapples, disarms and takedowns are not allowed, uh, if you take a person from a sport fencing background they go into HEMA, uh, number one strategy against them, this is my third tip of the day, um, grapple them. Uh, so the best way to set that up is you keep fencing at distance, they get used to it, and then when you're doing all of that stuff, suddenly rah, come in. You know, find a situation where you're bound up and you're, you're thinking, okay, I know where I am, I know where they are, they're probably not going to come around and hit me by surprise. Now we go in and try half-sorting, stealing their weapon out of their hands or throwing them to the ground if they, uh, you know, if it's allowed. They agree of each other first or if it's in the tournament rules or whatever. But um, it means that that sort of stuff like gripping the opponent's weapon and thrusting him, which by the way shows up in multiple treatises, Right the way from, I don't know if it features in I-33, the uh, Sword and Buckler tree, just probably because it's, it's, you know, Sword and Buckler, so you've got a shield in your hand. But I know at least as early as Fiore de la Berry, which is a late medieval period, you've got people gripping the opponent's weapon and then, you know, doing some sort of attack. So you've actually gripped the blade either close to the hand or even at the tip, I've controlled the opponent's weapon, I know where it is, and I've attacked. Worst case scenario, they start pulling at it and I wound my hand, but chop, I've cut your neck open. That's a better trade, I think, than getting stabbed on each other, you know? Um, also features in, I think, some stuff like rapier and even small sword. Sometimes showing versions where you're using your hand to guide the opponent's weapon offside. You're not gripping the weapon. You're kind of this. This is specifically of thrusting weapons. You guide their weapon aside using your hand, almost like it's a fleshy shield, and then you're performing your attack at the same time. Because in those specific cases, it's the point of the weapon that's the danger, and they're probably not cutting at you. Whereas if you're up against a cutting weapon, binding with your weapon and then gripping their blade to stop it from moving and killing them is more common. But still, it's extensively shown. I can't remember if there are historical accounts of duels and bat battles where it, there are specific cases mentioned of it happening. Would be good if someone could tell me in the comments if they did. But I know at the very least it shows up often in multiple different treatises with multiple different weapons. So it's definitely a thing, and I've done it myself in live sparring against an opponent who is not cooperating and very much wants it not to happen. I've still managed it multiple times. Um, but yes, so people in sport fencing don't have those kinds of things. You're not allowed to do that. I once had the other guy who goes to that sport fencing club from my background, and he did a Beautiful exchange, which is chef kissing, moi, just amazing. And he'd, uh, he's left-handed, so the person performed a thrust. He'd, ta he'd taken it aside, grab, grab their blade, and then huh, thrust in. And I, oh, applause. But I'm sorry, it's against the rules, so the opponent gets a point instead. Ah, oh, but the exchange itself was beautiful. <laughs> but um. Yes, so that can also change a fencer's perspective. Grappling doesn't happen all the time. I mean, you know, we've got sharp weapons for a purpose. Cut them, stab them, parry stuff, you know, the sort of normal stuff that happens with a weapon. Surprise, that's what you're doing nearly all the time. But having that option open to do things like grapples, throws, disarms, takedowns, or just controlling their weapon in a gripping way, all of these things should still be trained, I think, and should be considered. Um, that's my take. But yes, so, to be honest, I, I was kind of more judgmental in the past towards sport fencing, and I thought that it wasn't as viable, I thought, oh, it's crap and all this. But now that I've actually done it, 
it feels more like in Hema you've got, it, it's kind of like the spreading of butter is more thin, so to some degree you're becoming a jack of all trades master of none, sometimes you're learning these things and I feel like sometimes I want to spend more time on a particular thing to cement it and get really good at it. And sometimes people are starting to learn things but they haven't really learned this outside stuff. You know, I want more time to try and do that. It, again, your mileage may vary, experiences will differ. But um, with things like sport fencing, it's a narrower focus. You've got less stuff being trained, but you absolutely get it right. And that's why there's been the joke that people in HEMA have really bad footwork, whereas people in sport fencing have really good footwork. Because one of their focuses is on, it might be linear, you're not going around each other, but forwards, backwards, doing okay. things like lunges and all that stuff, they do it well. They make sure that it's done good. So yeah, that's that. Um, let me know in the comments if there's anything else you want me to discuss further. That's the whole genie thing after all. And uh, I shall probably see you in the next video, but before I do, I'm going to show off my mask because I put a lot of effort into this. Look at those riveted rings. That's right, it's not being butted mail anymore. I'm doing it riveted like a real knight. And uh, I said I've got experience in HEMA. I could show you footage of me doing fighting, but here's how you know that I am experienced. Right, watch this. Ready for a fight. You can't fake that. Actually, you could.